something that's that maybe some people in Denver know a little bit about. But um, okay, so the the idea of, of stink. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, what what what? How did that nickname come about? There's basically there, there's two parts to the story. Um, how I actually got the name stink, which was actually stinkhead originally, and how it evolved into just stink. So. Stinkhead comes from when I was a rookie with the Washington Redskins. My, t uh, my sister taught an Eskimo village in Anchorage, uh, just outside of Anchorage, Alaska, in Akiachuk, Alaska, which is located on the Kuskokwim River. And the very first run of salmon during the season, the native people would dip net the salmon, take them out of the river, then they would dig a big hole, a pit, they would cut off the heads, they would clean the salmon, cut off the heads, they put the heads in this pit, then they would bury them. And they would let the heads ferment. And then they would dig up the heads a week later and eat them rotten. And they called them stink heads. And so my sister had told me this story and I was relaying this to some guys, you know, that wanted to go fishing up in Alaska. So from that point forward, I was nicknamed Stinkhead. Well, in my second year with the Redskins, I started as a rookie. And so I was on this really famous offensive line the Hogs with the Washington Redskins. And I was the, the youngest player on the Hogs. And, you know, I was there with Jacoby and, and Russ Grimm, Hall of Famer, and Jeff Bostick and all these guys. And so everybody called me Stinkhead. Well, what ended up happening was um, we're playing a game in my second year. Uh, we're playing in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. And it's a you know, Friday night game is the third preseason game. And back then, you used to actually play in the preseason games, unlike in today's game, where you buy your ticket to go watch the Broncos and you watch a bunch of guys that play that aren't going to make the team. It was different back when I was playing. We actually <laughs> played in the games. And so being the youngest guy, I was not only the starting guard or starting right guard, but I was also the backup center and the backup left guard. So I was the first guy off the bench if somebody got hurt on the inside. And so we played the whole three, third quarter, our whole three, first three quarters. We get out of the third quarter, and I'm sitting on the bench, and it's a sultry, steamy night, and I'm sweaty, and it's nasty. And, you know, I've been drinking water. i got to keep my shoulder pads on. Everybody else gets to take theirs off. And I have to urinate. And so I'm just, like, sitting on the bench, and I'm like, I'm going to go. And all my buddies are like, no, no you're okay. Like, Don't do that. I go, no, I'm going to go. And I like completely empty my bladder and it's like dripping off the end of the bench. I mean, it's, and I'm laughing and they're all getting up. They're like, oh my gosh. So I turn around, I'm waving to the fans, you know, like, like these people have no idea what's going on, right? I, I kid you not, I literally just finish, you know, to the point where you're like shaking it off type of finish, right? Yeah. And they call my name like, hey, so-and-so got hurt. So I jump off the bench grab my helmet, run to the sideline. Now, meanwhile, my pants are just soaked with urine. <laughs> Stan Humphreys is a backup quarterback. And Stan goes, hey, let me get a warm-up snap before we go in. The center guy. Right <laughs> and I'm like, all right. So I get over the ball, and the quarterbacks never – they never get all the way in first. Like, Daniel played quarterback. Yeah. The first thing you do is kind of put your hand on the guy's low back, and you put one hand on, like, his right butt cheek, right? <laughs> so you don't actually get in there. You just kind of let him know you're back there. So he gets in and he goes, blue 80, blue 80. And he puts his hands, he goes, Sit and I snap it and splash. And, he, and oh, like, oh, oh, no. Hey, guys, get him a towel. He's soaking wet. I got sweat in my eyes. And, and everybody on the bench was just howling because they knew I had just peed my pants. And um, oh. from that point forward, it, it went from stink head just to stink. And um, – and it became kind of an NFL legend, and they're probably are a, a kind of a fork lore, lore in the NFL. And true. It wasn't a game where I didn't, uh, I didn't fully empty my bladder, but I peed my pants just every game that I ever played. Like from that point <laughs> forward, it was just oh a, man, it became a thing. That was awesome! My goodness, that's hilarious. Yeah, my that's cheeks are already hurt. Hear, though, but yeah, both both true stories. Love it. <laughs> So, okay, so um, again, we're just so grateful that you're here and we just love uh, your son and his whole family and just really, really an honor to have you guys a part of Thrive. And so, yeah, honor to have you here. Um, so you grew up in Alaska. Uh -huh. You played college in Idaho. Um, how did you get started with football? 
Um, you know, I, I really wanted to play because um, my buddies were playing. And this was in the seventh grade. And I was always very much like Daniel. I was always a gifted athlete. I could run and I could jump. And I, I, I was always just a gifted, very skilled athlete. Um, but I spent my whole childhood basically working every weekend with my father. We had five acres in Alaska. We had horses. Um, so there was always, you know, horse stalls to repair. There was always fences to repair. There was always uh, stalls to muck. There was like, there was never a time where I wasn't working. And, you know, the crazy thing about that, as much as I hated that at times, it was my father and I's thing. And the thing that I developed was I developed this ridiculous body strength. Daniel will tell you, his grandfather, um, my, all my college buddies call him poolside um because he's just he's a freak of nature i mean my dad is yeah. my dad is on his 78th birthday my dad benched 300 pounds um oh. my dad is 81 years old and if you saw him we, you would think we're brothers um he is he's okay. that put together so he's just a he's just a perpetual motion machine and my dad always used to tell me while we were working and all my buddies were playing um that, uh, you know, this was going to be really good. You know, it's going to make me a stronger athlete because he knew I liked athletics. Um, and, you know, I never really believed him. But when I started actually competing against other kids, I realized how much just overall strength, how much stronger I was and how much better I was just simply from, you know, holding on to the end of a wheelbarrow since the time I was five. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, that's all I did is dig ditches and build fences and, you know, and, I'd be on one side of a railroad tie that was 300 pounds. He'd be on the other side and we'd be carrying it. And I'd, I'd be seven years old, you know I mean? That's just the way I grew up. And so um, I did what every kid does when he wants to play a sport. I asked my mother and my mother did what every mother does. She said, go ask your father. And I'll never forget it. It's a rainy day in, in Alaska, which is pretty common. And my dad was working out in the horse barn. And um, so I, I go trotting out there and I had been working somewhere else in the yard, but I got the courage to ask my mom during like lunch or whatever. So I go trotting out there in the rain and I ask my father, like, can, can I play? You know, all, all my buddies are playing. Can I play? This was the seventh grade. So I was 12 years old, my first year of football, organized football. And my dad takes this real pregnant pause as, you know, fathers like to do, right? To, to like, they're thinking about it, right? And so he said, yeah, you, you can play, but he goes, you've got to promise me two things. Said, you got to promise me one, that whatever you are asked to do, you'll do it to the best of your ability. And two, once you start, you cannot quit. And you know, you're 12 years old, like that's easy, right? Yeah, absolutely. Why would I even think about <laughs> quitting, right? So I go to football practice in the first like four days, it's just, running and throwing and catching and doing all that stuff. So, you know, I'm, I'm like, without bragging, I'm by far the best athlete on the team. And I can throw the ball farther than anybody else. I can run faster than anybody else. You know, it's just the way it is. And I become the starting quarterback. But I'm also one of the biggest kids on the team. And so for the first three or four days, I'm the starting quarterback of this football team. And all of a sudden, we get pads on, and we're trying to put an offensive line together. And none of the kids want to play offensive line. They're shuffling their feet. Like, nobody wants to be that guy, right? And because I'm one of the biggest guys, we can't even get a quarterback center exchange. So the coach goes, hey, hey, Mark, will you snap a ball to the backup quarterback? It was a guy, a, a friend of mine by the name of Tim Stanley, little guy. And will you snap the ball to Tim? I said, Absolutely. Remember what my dad said, you know, about giving great effort and stuff. So I get over the ball, I snap it to Timmy. And it's, you know, we ex execute the, the snap. We do it again. We do it again. And I went in three snaps. I went from the starting quarterback to the starting center of my 12 year old <laughs> football team. And I mean, I'm playing center. I had number 15 was my, <laughs> was my number. And I am devastated. Yeah. I go through practice. My mom picks me up and I ball all the way home. I cry like a, I cry like a bait, like where snot's coming in and out of your nose, you know, it's just in and out and in and out <laughs> and I am bawling. And, um, and I tell my mom, I'm, I'm not going to play anymore. I'm going to quit. Um, 
And, you know, interestingly enough, I, I, I stopped crying after, I don't know, an hour or so. And then my dad comes home from work. I hear the car pull up and instantly, you know, waterworks. I'm, I'm you know, crying. And, and so my dad pulls in the garage and he comes in. And my mom tells him what happened. And um, I tell him, you know, my dad comes in. He says, hey, I'm proud of you for giving great effort, blah, blah, blah. And I said, hey, I'm, I, I don't want to play. I'm going to quit. And he goes, no, that wasn't our deal. That's mm -hmm. not our deal. You got it you got to suck it up and you got to play. And, you know, interestingly enough, I went, I went on to be an all state center. I went on to get a scholarship to the university of Idaho to play center. I got drafted by the Redskins in the 10th round to play center. Um, you know, it worked out pretty well, all things considered. Um, God's got a plan and sometimes you just can't see it. Um, and yeah. so just the fact that, you know, I, just the fact that, that, I persevere, you know? Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those, it's one of those, what, what does James say? Consider it all a joy when you face trials and tribulations because the testing of your faith produces perseverance and let that perseverance have its perfect result that you're mature, complete, lacking in nothing. And that is, you know, that is one of those life lessons that while you're going through it, it's really hard to understand what's happening, especially when you thought you were going to be the next Terry Bradshaw yeah. and, you know, and you become a center that nobody really cares about. Um, <laughs> and, but you know, that's, that was just part of the story of the, the kind of the football journey. Man, that's amazing. So, so good. Um, all right. So Idaho, you're at Idaho and maybe they're not known to produce a ton of mm -hmm. NFL players. How, when did you ever know in that process that, I think I can make it in NFL. Um, I didn't. I mean, like I always had that dream. Um, but I tore, I had some knee injuries in high school and then I tore an ACL um, in college. My first year I was a, I, I went as a center, but I was like, I was such a gifted athlete that they moved me to the defensive side of the ball. And I was an all conference nose guard actually as a freshman redshirt freshman and I tore my ACL late in in the playoffs and um and so I went in and, and had surgery I was 19 years old I was by myself my parents didn't fly in for stuff like that you know and they were like oh <laughs> hey good luck hope you don't die um they just like <laughs> you know so back then ACL surgery was pretty uh it was pretty serious and I woke up in Griffin Memorial Hospital after this ACL surgery, just an excruciating pain in what they call a CPM machine that pulls your leg straight to the, the point of just sweat and bullets, excruciating pain, and then slowly bends it up to the point of excruciating pain, sweating bullets. And you're just sitting there up and down and it's on 24 hours a day. And I was in the hospital for three days and, um, after the surgery on that machine, um, taking morphine shots, every chance I could take a morphine shot, whenever, like whenever they would give me one, it was miserable. And I swore to myself, I was 19 years old. I swore that I'd never play again. I was like, that's it. I'm not ever playing this game again. And, um, you know, it's the, the, the interesting thing is up to that point, I really didn't, I really didn't do much from a school standpoint. I was naive enough to think that I was athletic enough to make it to the NFL. And when that happened to me, I probably had about, you know, a one point, I, whatever, like D stood for diploma and whatever I had to do to stay eligible. That's, that's what I was doing. <laughs> and at that point, I started to look at myself going, man, you ain't going to play in it. Like the odds of you ever playing again are not good. And so then I started actually going to school and going to class and getting an education. And, um, you know, from that, the, from that point forward, I was a, you know, as a, a, a B, a three point, whatever GPA from that point forward. Um, but that was kind of one of those eye opening experiences for me. Um, I actually had so many more injuries. I came back from the ACL, kept playing, kept having knee injuries, let, left the, the, the offense or the defensive side of the ball, went back over to the offensive side of the ball. I was playing a game in Idaho State and uh, I got my elbow caught in a pile and in the helmet in the back and it dislocated my elbow so my arm was the opposite way it's supposed to be and i literally grabbed my wrist i was so scared and popped my elbow back in the socket during the game 
and I played the rest of that series. And I played like, like I had one little tiny Tyrannosaurus arm right here. And I come off the field, my coach is like, what are you doing? Because I'm blocking people with one hand. I go, oh, I did something really bad to my elbow. And the doctor looked at it and it was like a spaghetti noodle. Like it was just completely, you know, flopping around. Yeah. And so um, that was it. And I had another surgery for my elbow. And at that point, um, I had had six knee surgeries and I had an elbow surgery. And, wow. and, um, and the University of Idaho retired me from football. So I was done. Um, and I had the surgery and, you know, I was depressed for a while. And then I started lifting and working out again. And, and I thought to myself, well, you know what? You guys kind of owe this to me. And I'm healing. And I'm, you know, you're in your 20s, whatever, right? You heal pretty quickly. And so I, I pestered the Idaho staff, the coaching staff. I pestered the administrators that you guys owe me this. You, you need to let me, you know, you need to let me play. I was with my, my head coach at the time, Keith Gilbertson. I was with him last year. And we were telling this story. He goes, that's not really how I remember it. I remember it, you throwing me against the wall and threatening my life if you didn't let me play, if I didn't let you play, because I was officially retired. I don't really remember doing that. But, uh, <laughs> but anyhow, um, I, was, I was fairly convincing that I needed to play my last year. And finally, they let me play um, with a promise to sign waivers to limit their liability towards me as an injury risk. So I did that. Uh, I played my senior year. And, and made it through. Here's a, here's a really cool thing about my, just my football story at Idaho. I made it through, but I had played defense. I had been injured. I had been retired from football. I moved back to offense. I only played one season of college football. And I didn't have an agent. I didn't have any interest. I had nothing. And I was working out, and I was just hoping that something would happen. And one, one night – my buddy Marvin Washington, who played one year of college football, got 14 sacks, and every team in the league wanted to draft him. Um, he was a basketball player. Um, one night he calls me up, and he knew my, my childhood dream from the time I was 12 was to play in the NFL. And he said, hey, man, uh, I just wanted to give you a call. He goes, the Bengals are going to be here tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. He goes, just crash my workout. Come to my workout. Wow. And so I show up. I introduce myself. I just beg the scouts to let me work out for him. And the crazy thing is, is Marvin was 6'6", 275, chiseled from a piece of granite. I mean, this guy is put together. But even with all the injuries, I could out bench him. I could, I, my 40 time was better than him. My vertical jump was better. Like, I would blow him away in all these workouts. I probably cost him three rounds in the draft. He went to the Jets <laughs> in the sixth round. And I just destroyed him in all these workouts. But he was faithful. And he kept calling me. And he kept inviting me to his workouts. And he probably called me and invited me to 15 of his workouts. In each one of the workouts, I blow him. I mean, I blow him out of the water in these workouts. And eventually, teams started calling me directly and wanting to come work me out. And um, and so I ended up making a name for myself. And then agents started calling that wanted to represent me, and um, and ended up getting drafted in the 10th round by the University of Idaho. And you know, if it wasn't for Marvin Washington being a faithful friend, um, I would have never played the NFL. I would have never gotten a shot. But one of the coolest yeah. things, and Daniel mentioned, Daniel mentioned Super Bowl 32. <clears throat> we won Super Bowl 32 on my 32nd birthday. It was January 25th, 1999. I turned 32 on Super Bowl 32. So after the Super Bowl, I'm in the training room because I was more of a professional rehabber than I was a football player. I was always rehabbing. <laughs> I'm in the training room, and Mike Shanahan comes down, and he's like, oh, yo, Stink, I need to ask you a question. And I said, yeah, Mike, what is it? And he, and he, he hands me this, like, this notebook, right? But this notebook has like seven, eight names on it. And he said, hey, listen, man, I need to sign – he goes, I need to sign – uh, a veteran defensive tackle, defensive end, a guy that can, you know, can spell us and play both, you know, play up and down the line of scrimmage. Um, not a starter, but just a backup guy. And here's seven guys on my list. And he goes, I just want, most importantly, I want a guy that fits the culture of all football team. Hmm. And so I literally, I pick the paper up from Mike and I look at it. And the first name I see, Marvin Washington. And so I say, sign him. He's one of us. Wow. Wow. Mike signed him. And then Marvin and I, University of Idaho teammates, uh, the reason I got to play in the NFL, won Super Bowl 33 together. 
So come on. Yeah. How about that? How about that? So that is, you know, being being faithful and being connected, and you know, you talked about replenishing when you started yes. talking today. The, the fact that you can be connected. We live in a society where, and Daniel talked about, you know, the first thing you do is look at your phone for Clint Hurdle's message. We live in a society where we're, we've never been more connected by technology and less connected as people. And, right. and you know, to connect as people, to, to stand in faith with one another. Um, you know, I, I was speaking up in Wyoming the other, the other day, and I was just talking about the connection that, that faith plays and how much stronger our faith grows when we're connected as people. Um, so good. In Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us consider, it says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, but encouraging one another and all the more as the day draws near, right? And, and the thing that's beautiful about that to me is let us consider, how do we consider to, to stimulate one another to love and good deeds? It's by assembling together. To so good. Not for, yeah, like, how do we do it? We assemble together and we encourage one another when we do that. And you think about, you know, you can find it in the Gospels, but the story of the paralytic where the four friends take their paralytic friend to see Jesus, right? And I envision this amphitheater and they can't get in because there's hordes of people there. And they take them around the back and they get them up on the roof and then they lower them to Jesus' feet. And, yeah. and Jesus says, at that time, he says, you, um, because of your friend's faith, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and the teachers are just like, they go crazy, right? Who are you to forgive sins? And he says, well, is it easier for me to say, get up and walk, take your mat and go? But the cool thing to me was, it, is what Jesus said. He looked up and said, because of their faith, collectively, the fact that they assembled together and they brought their friend to see Jesus, he goes, not your faith, paralytic guy, their faith, your sins are forgiven. And, and that connectivity and that connection to me is, it's one of the most amazing, amazing things that we have as, as people. And one of the things that I think we have lost in this day and age is people. So, so good. And, and I think about how even COVID and, and, and this is, you know, kind of isolated people a little bit. Maybe there's even some people here that are trying to say, um, do I need to connect with people anymore? It's been a long time. I've kind of been out of touch. I mean, what would you say to maybe some of those people that have um, kind of been disconnected a little bit here? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think it's, I think it's important to be connected. It's important to, to be together. It's important for us um, to hold each other accountable and, and yeah. to encourage one another. And like, like, what do they say? No man's an island. I mean, it's, it's just hard to do it on your own. Um, and it's so much better and it's so much more rewarding when you do it together. That's the beauty of, of being a part of a team, a great team. And Daniel will tell you, like, there is nothing better than being part of a, a team, being connected that way to where, you know, you will be sacrificial in your approach to the game for the betterment of the team. Paul right into the church at Philippi, you know, you know, the Philippians, um, where he says, and this is always something, you know, I always envision um, business owners getting together and, and, and putting together a mission statement, you know, and they all sit down at a big steak dinner and they all have their steaks and they have a couple of bottle of wines and they craft this beautiful mission statement. And at the end of it, they're like, oh yes, we nailed it, man, we're good. We're patting each other, high five and stuff. And then they never, ever look at it again, right? And I always think, well, what's my personal mission statement? How do I want to treat people? And I always think of Paul writing to the church from prison, saying, make my joy complete. Philippians 2, chapter 2, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, of the same love, united in spirit. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard each of, each of you as more important than yourself. Like, that is, that to me... You want to talk about how to be successful in a church, how to be successful in a business, how to be su successful as a football player or a football team. That Philippians 2, 2 and 3. Make that part of your life. Make that part of your culture. Live that part of your culture every single day. 
and watch your church thrive, watch your business thrive, watch your family thrive, watch everything in your life thrive. That's so, so good. Um, so I got I to gotta ask you this. You've talked to me about this before, um, and I want to hear from both of you on this, but I've heard about these Bible studies mm -hmm. that you would do. So you went to Washington, but you came obviously to Denver. Can you talk a little bit about some of those Bible studies? And I want to hear from your perspective. You'd have football players come into your house. And I mean, mm -hmm. this isn't just, you know, this is something that you have uh, lived for a long time. Um, right. Can you just talk about those? I'd love to hear from your perspective what it was like to, you know, be a kid and have a bunch of NFL guys hanging out at your house as well. Yeah, well, you know, I grew up in that environment in, in Washington. And, um, and so that was part of, what we did with the Redskins and it was a big part of our team and every week we got together and you know Joe Gibbs used to invite us to you know we do it in, in training camp we do bible studies like Joe Gibbs would get so excited about altar calls and having the having our team chaplain come up you know and invite people to Jesus in a team meeting like like that's Joe um Joe's an incredible man and so um I mean, that was part of that was part of of my growth process and part of what I what I lived coming into the NFL, and so you know my the guys that I aspired to be like, you know it's it's so interesting to watch some of the racial tensions that we have because when you play a professional sport you start to realize that what makes us alike there's a lot more that connects us than it does divide us right. right. And we all want essentially the same things. Yep. And you learn just to love one another and rely on one another. So the guys to me who were my, you know, my spiritual um, guidance guys and guys that I aspired to be like were all black men. And they were all Charles Mann and Art Monk and Monty Coleman and Daryl Green. And these were my, you know, these are brothers in Christ who really helped develop, you know, my walk and my journey. Um, and so that started when I came to Denver, there was no Bible study. So obviously I was like, well, that's going to be at my house. And my wife has a gift to serve. She's an, um, Daniel will tell you, unbelievable cook. Um, and so <laughs> she would cook every Monday night and every Monday I would, I would put out, um, flyers in everybody's locker and I invite the whole team and we would usually have, you know, 10, 15 guys show up. And um, it was a wonderful time. We'd do a Bible study, and we would eat. We'd watch Monday Night Football. Daniel and his buddies were downstairs watching Monday Night Raw, the wrestling, right? Because that was big yeah. back then. But we'd have the game on, and we'd all eat and, and do all this stuff. I I'll tell you an interesting story. The team chaplain of the Baltimore Ravens is a guy by the name of Harry Swain. Now, Harry Swain was a teammate of mine in Denver. And every day, and this is how you can affect people for Jesus without ever saying anything. Just by the way you love people. Just by yes. the way you, you connect with people. So, good. so every Monday, Harry Swain, we played together for four years. Every Monday, I not only invited him with a flyer, but I asked him to come. And every Monday, he graciously that uh, turned down my invitation for four years, every single Monday. Harry, man, love to have you at the house. Bring your, you know, bring your significant other. He was married at the time. Bring your girlfriend, whatever. And we'll just eat and hang out. Harry Swain is now the chaplain of the Baltimore Ravens. He called me a year ago and said, I've, I've been meaning to share this with you. I have never shared this with you. But the way you lived in the locker room, you and Tony Jones and a couple other guys, the way you guys were gracious to me and kind to me, even though you knew I was running the streets and doing things, brought me to Christ. Wow. Convicted me enough to say, you know what? I'm going to give my life to Jesus. And he goes, wow. we left Super Bowl 33. I wasn't starting at the time. I was a backup player. I had started the year. I had started a bunch the previous years. And he goes, I was in this caravan of limos, and we were going to tie one on. And it was going to be just a mess of an evening. And he goes, I was so convicted that I told my limo driver to take a left. And I made him take me back to the hotel. 
And he goes, and I gave my life to Christ. And what? Yeah, it, it, like the night of the Super Bowl, after a Super Bowl victory, and said, that's it, I can't live this way anymore. And he said, it was you, and it was Tony Jones, and it was a couple of the Christian guys that loved on him, that he never came to one of those studies, he never came to anything, that ended up changing his heart toward Jesus. And, you know, it's the, what's the old saying? Don't just go to church, be the church. Wow. Just be the church every day. Man. So good. That's so powerful. That's right. I mean, you can, you can speak and you can say things, but the way that you live, yes. I love to hear from your perspective. You know, you were in the house, <clears throat> yeah. um, those Bible studies. What's yeah. some of your memories from those? Oh, I, <laughs> I wasn't really paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we were playing football upstairs and jumping off beds and <laughs> uh, just being kids really. But I remember that we would have like 15 to 20 guys and then all together, it would probably be around 50 people in our house. <laughs> the, the house was packed, but it was great. Yeah. That's like, that's what we did. Yeah. yeah. I did, all these backstories, I don't really know all this, but yeah. right. it's pretty fun to listen to. Man. I love it's it. It's good. I'm, yeah. I haven't heard the Harry Swain story. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Well, I just, hey, I heard it for the first time last, like literally at the Super Bowl. He pulled me aside. Yeah. So it's less than a year ago. It's amazing. Yeah. That's cool. I didn't know that. That's. <laughs> That's incredible. So, Mark, I'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, you you are uh, a man of character, integrity. Um, you're incredible with words. Um, I I emailed you this, but I think uh, um, you're one of my favorite people to listen to. You're incredible, um, incredible with words. God's really given you an incredible gift. But I, I was curious, uh, what is your um, what's the story of you turning to the Lord? Can you remember? Um, was that yeah. when you were young or when was that well, moment I, when you said, I'm going to follow the Lord and, right. and this is, this is real. This isn't just, I'm going to church cause I'm supposed to, but this is, right. this is real on the inside. So I grew up, I grew up, my mother is an incredible, just an mm -hmm. incredibly strong Christian yes. woman. And, um, and so I grew up going to victory Bible camp and, you know, <laughs> you know, you, you know, the story, like, uh, uh, give me hot sauce on my taco. Help me witness in Morocco. Give, you know, I mean, I did it all, right? So, yeah. You know, uh, I went all growing up um, doing that stuff. So I always had a strong faith, and I gave my life to Christ as as a kid. Um, what really what really struck me more than anything else when it really became the most real for me is my rookie year with the Washington Redskins. And, um, and um, I'm in a meeting, and, you know, I want to make the team, right? And Joe Gibbs, I told you, Joe Gibbs introduces Lee Corder as our, our team chaplain. Mm -hmm. And Joe Gibbs is so excited. And we're going to have this big Bible study. And, and it's after team meeting, so it's going to be from 10 to 11 o'clock at night, right? I mean, because we did our meetings, and back then, I mean, we, we practiced twice a day, full pads, and it was, like, it was real live scrimmage. It was, I mean, it was, it was vicious. And so <laughs> Joe was so excited about Bible study, and he invited the whole team, please come, everybody show up, right? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I showed up. Because I thought, if it comes down to me and one other rookie to make the team, and I'm the guy that's front center in Bible study, he'll pick me. That's really why I showed up. Like more than anything, that's why I showed up. I was like, this will give me a, a, a stronger advantage over a non-Christian guy, right, if I show up to Bible study. So I got the invitation. I obviously had grown up in the church. I obviously wanted to go listen to the pastor. But truth be told, the number one reason is I wanted to be seen by the head coach. So I walk in there and I am surrounded by guys, you know, you know, in John 13, 35, it says, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. Yeah. Pretty simple. Yes. And I literally, that's the first time I ever walked into a room where I didn't know the scripture at the time, but it was real. Those guys were those guys they loved each other they loved each other's families they they held each other accountable they had their own individual bible studies they had group bible studies they had accountability groups they had prayer groups i mean these guys loved each other and they welcomed me 
into that family. And it was probably the first time all the years that I had gone to church and I went to church is more of an obligation because it's what you did. It was really the first time where I said, wow, this is really, this is really different. And it was modeled for me for six years in Washington. You know, Joe Gibbs in 1992, I had been a pro bowler. We had won the Super Bowl. In 1992, I had a knee and an elbow that desperately needed surgery. And I was, I like couldn't walk. Like there were Saturdays where I little, literally couldn't participate in a walkthrough. My knee was so bad. And I started every game, every game on Sunday. And Joe hated it when you didn't practice. Right. And so I'm leaving the facility. It's like a Thursday evening. And I've come up the elevator and the elevator doors open and Joe Gibbs is standing there. And he says, Hey, come see me in my office tomorrow morning. You know, right before our nine o'clock meeting, come see me, 845, right? Now, Joe was a night owl, so he'd be up till two o'clock in the morning putting in game plans and stuff. Now, the worst thing you can say to a player is, come see me tomorrow, mm. right? You would much rather say, hey, yeah. just give it to me straight. Are you cutting me? You're going to bench me? What's going on, right? But don't make me stew on this all night. So I go home and I, I barely sleep a wink because I'm worried about what's going to transpire. And I show up to his office door and I listen, I barely, I barely knock. It's just barely, you can barely, it's barely audible. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking maybe he'll fall. Maybe he's sleeping right now. I'll barely knock. And he'll be like, Hey, I didn't catch you this morning. I knocked on the door. Nobody answered. <laughs> you know? And uh, so I barely knocked on the door and Joe invited me into his office. And so I come into his office and he said, Hey, um, I just want you to know how much I appreciate you playing injured and you playing hurt. And I've been thinking a lot about it. And he said, if you think you're doing permanent damage to yourself that you're not going to be able to overcome, he goes, I'm going to put you on IR right now and we're going to go have this thing operated on so you can come back at full strength next year. And I said, well, I, you know, I appreciate that, but I'm really committed to this football team, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, Hey, do me a favor. He goes, look over there. And he points to this grease board on the back of the wall. And on that grease board, there's about 15 or 16 names. And mine is one of them. And he said, on that board, there are guys that have injury issues, that have marital issues, that have family issues, whatever the case may be. And he goes, I want you to know that I spend time in my office every day on my knees praying for you by name. Wow. That was the Washington Redskins organization. And that was the kind of love and kind of care and the kind of leadership and the culture that I grew up in, in the NFL. And that was what I felt like was my responsibility to bring to the Broncos as best I could. Man, <laughs> that's incredible to hear that about a coach in the NFL leading yeah. that way. And I mean, that that's just uh, an amazing story. I mean, that's how you, um, I mean, I, I think as a Christian, that's how you would hope somebody wouldn't hide it. But, you know, if that's, if that's what they believe, that that's the way that they would live. That's, that's incredible, incredible stories. Um, my goodness. So um, you have, you work for ESPN and then you moved over to Fox and you call mm -hmm. games and you have a radio show, of course, and uh do some acting things, a few things, businesses on the side. Um, you got a few things going on. So question is, how do you stay grounded in your faith with all that going on? Maybe some guys are like, you know, I'm busy. I'd like to invest in my faith, those kind of things. Um, you're, you're doing quite a bit. Uh, how, do you, how do you stay grounded inside all that? Um, well, one is, is that um, I haven't always done it right. But I have always been sold out for my family. Um, True. You know, people always ask me, like, as a father, how do you spend quality time with your kids? And I said, anytime I set an hour aside to spend some quality time with my kids, they did something to piss me off. So, um, you know, it was quantity. I was just always involved. Um, I didn't outsource the raising of my children. I was always, I was always there. And so I understand... I understand the importance of my family and what I'm trying to accomplish. 
Um, the other thing is there's a couple of things I think about. You know, I started doing um, a daily devotion. I read this article. It was actually an article that was written um, in Business Weekly or something, one of these publications. I was on a plane. It was about Jerry Seinfeld. And Jerry said that he had this mantra as a young comedian. And the mantra was, don't break the chain. So he committed to every day writing a joke for 365 days and he is struggling to pay his rent. But every day he was diligent. He said, sometimes a joke would come to me in two minutes. It'd be a great joke. See, some days I would sit at my kitchen table for four hours trying to come up with a joke, but I was committed. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. That is a really cool kind of thought process. And so I still have a day timer because I like to write and Every top of my day timer, there's the week that is, and then there's a page for notes. The top of my day timer for the last, it's over three years now, um, the top of my day timer says, don't break the chain. And every day I write a scripture from a devotional that I do in my day timer. And then the other thing I do every day is, this is what I know about problems. As soon as you solve one, there's another to take its place. Mm there's always going to be problems. I focus every day on intentional gratitude. I am thankful for the things that are right. I am thankful for the things that are happening in my life. I am thankful for the opportunities to persevere. Um, you know, I have shifted, I have shifted my mindset from I'm too busy to spend time with God today to I'm too busy not to spend time with God today. And that is something that, that I am very diligent. Now, sometimes it's, it's more time than others, but it is time that I spend on a daily basis um, trying to absorb some of God's word, trying to do a devotional, spending time just praising God for all the things that are good. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty. If you, if you can look past yourself, you know, if you can look at life with this God's eye lens, and Daniel will tell you, you know, one of the cool things, um, when I got really sick in 1993 with a, a sickness called Guillain-Barre syndrome, and I lost all the feeling in my arms and legs for about six months, um, the only thing I could do, uh, and I didn't know if I'd ever play again, and, and I didn't have enough money to keep the house that we were in. I mean, there's like, there are real, there's real issues here. And the only thing I could do was get up every day and make the kids lunches before they went to school. And I got really good. I like to think of myself as a really good lunch maker. I like to think of, I, I, I thought that I actually invented aerosol cheese, you know, the kind of cheese you spray out of a can. I like, that's my thing, it's right? Cheese, I was making cheese and crackers and cheese and celery. And like, I was just spraying cheese and sandwiches. I mean, it was unbelievable. <laughs> but one of the things I started doing, and Daniel will tell you, was I started writing like inspirational notes or stupid things or what on the napkins of my kids lunches and this went all through high school until they got out of school and it became like an event to sit down with daniel or his sister alex or his sister avery and see what i wrote on their napkin for that day and you know how god can change the lens that you look through right i look back on this time of uncertainty and I look back on it with fond memories because at that time I was connecting with my kids in a way that, that I didn't even think about, that I didn't even realize I could connect with them. And I was up in Avery's room just the other day. I know Daniel threw all his napkins away, I'm sure. But, but, but on her, in her childhood room, there's still one of the napkins. And my oldest daughter, Alex, has napkins in her scrapbook that meant something to her and that were, and, and same with Avery. So there's, there's this traumatic event going on in your life. And if you just choose to change the way you look at it and say, what, what, what incredible blessing is God going to bring out of this tragic moment in my life right now? And, and, you know, those, those opportunities to connect, I used to call it stealing time. Daniel will tell you, I mean, I think he rode the bus one time in his life. And that wasn't because, that was because my wife and I, we wanted to take him to school. I was like, hey, man, I have the opportunity to pick you up from school. And instead of 
kind of deep compressing with your buddies on the bus, you can decompress in the car with me. And okay. it's 15 minutes that I, I just took from you and you don't even realize I took it. And so that was always something that we were really, like we were really, you know, sold on. Man, man, oh man. It's so good. I, I, um, I think that's incredible. My goodness. What would you say is, this is a little off script, but I mean, what would you say is uh, just one of those things that you're most passionate to talk to people about? I mean, obviously faith and those things, but any specific angle or, I mean, what, what's kind of burning in your heart right now um, that, that just maybe encouragement or just, uh, you know, that, that you feel is important to share? I, you know, I think for, for me, um, oftentimes I'm re I can really be encouraging to people outside my family more than I can to people inside my family, especially my wife at times. And, and those are things that I'm convicted about being better. Um, you know, because I think it's easiest to take those people that you love so much for granted because they know that you love them. And, um, yep. and so that's something that, you know, that's something that, that I am, you know, currently convicted about and currently trying to work on. You know, it's, it's interesting because I've been traveling for the last 20 years and, you know, for the first four weeks of being home with, uh, with COVID, it was kind of fun. And then it was like, oh my gosh, like, yeah. really, you mean you're going to sit here again today for, you know, the next five hours, uh, you know, and, and so there, there wasn't a lot of grace um, involved in, in the last several weeks. So that's something that, you know, is, is really been heavy on my heart and trying to do a better job with, with that stuff, uh, really connecting and, and so, anyhow, those are things that those are things that I think about because I think that's the easiest thing to kind of take mm -hmm. for granted because we're right, we're always here, we're always together, right? And yeah, and there's plenty of people that need encouragement, and there's plenty of people that need to be loved on, right? But um, but you know, it's it's the old kind of bloom where you're planted. You got you got a great yeah. opportunity to water the grass right there at your house. Yeah. That's right. It's like your first ministry is the ministry in your own home. I think that's right. really good. Okay. So this is right <clears throat> along the same line. We got a question that came in this is for you, Daniel, but it says, I'd like to hear more about how Daniel's leading his family to God. You know, maybe, maybe, uh, what are some things that you do? Oh, I, I would say I give that credit to my wife. She's the one who found thrive. Mm. And I was the one who's like, oh, I'll stay home and take care of yeah. whoever. Um, so I'll give that credit all to her. That mm -hmm. was her saying, all right, I found this new church and I was mm -hmm. skeptical. I've always been skeptical yes. of different churches and like, yeah. okay, is this going to be, but that she was the driving force behind finding you guys. Mm -hmm. And I have her to thank for that. Mm -hmm. And this, she has been the past few years, kind of like the, mm -hmm. the horse of our family, yeah. just kind of leading us in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's probably something I need to do better mm -hmm. as the leader of the family, but mm -hmm. she has been an absolute stud for mm -hmm. us. Yeah, I know. My wife pushes me as well. So yes. if, if I don't have my crap together, she's going to, <laughs> I, I'm going to know about it, but um, we, we, yeah, we married good, good ladies who, uh, who push us, who push us really well. Yeah. Um, I will say this about I'd love, Daniel. Um, oh, go ahead. Because he is, you know, he is grinding out this career, Every door has been slammed in his face a million times. He just keeps fighting. He keeps going out and, and affecting people's lives. He is, I, I really admire Daniel in that he's one of the most loyal people I've ever been around. Um, loyal to his wife, loyal to his kids, loyal to his family. Um, and, and he's an amazing man that way. Um, doesn't often say a lot, but, um, but just if, if you just watch the way he behaves himself, he is yes. a, an incredible man. And so uh, I Thank actually you. want to be more like Daniel. Mm -hmm. start crying. <laughs> yeah. So good. And I, I think it's a special uh, to have you both on right now, obviously for many reasons, but one it's, it's father's day week right here. Um, father's day is this weekend. Um, I mean, any, oh, anything shoot. you want to say, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, to I didn't, I didn't growing realize. up, um, with, with, 
with obviously him as your father. I mean, oh, maybe gosh. maybe what what would be one or two lessons or or big big ideas that that you learned from your father? I have <laughs> listened to him talk. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'm the luckiest person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. all these people can see. Mm-hmm. I've had that my whole life, mm-hmm. and we we had a rough spell when when I was growing up in middle school, high school. We we were always butting heads about going to school and uh, and doing the right thing and doing my home. It's not going to school; it's actually paying attention when yeah. I got in there. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I told I used to tell them all the time. My teachers love me, Dad. These these people love me, and they're like, "Why do you got a D in this class?" <laughs> but uh, that was my comeback. I was like, "Dude, these teachers love me. <laughs> they love seeing me." Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You got to do your homework, though. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. So that that was rough, but now, as a dad of yeah two little ones, now it's like yeah. I am him now. Yep. Uh, not as great of a public speaker or as social in, in his, in his great ways, but I am him. I look in the mirror and I'm like, mm-hmm. I say the same things that he does. I, I talk to teammates. Like mm-hmm. he talked to me when I was a kid, mm-hmm. I would see me being the older mm-hmm. influence in locker room. But I mm-hmm. say the same things. I'm like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. My dad used to say it to me <laughs> yeah. when I was 15. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So this, the influence he's had on me, it's like saved my life. Yeah. I, I've got to, you know, it's, it's interesting because I'm just looking up here right now and you had talked to Daniel about, you know, when he thought he was going to be a professional player. Yeah. And I've known Daniel was going to be a professional player since he was seven. Um, I had that much belief. I, and I would tell you, if for all the fathers out there of young children, the best thing or the best advice or, or the, the one thing that I feel like I gave my kids is I believed in them. And, you know, Daniel talked about, Daniel talked about us button heads because he wouldn't do his schoolwork. And I just knew that he was so talented and so gifted that I just wanted that to be a part of it. And I'll never forget the night we are screaming at each other. He was a sophomore this is, and he yeah, wanted to go to a basketball, basketball game. Yeah. And, and he had terrible grades and I said, no, and we're screaming at each other. And he said, he said to me, I'm a good kid because I don't drink, I'm not getting anybody pregnant, I'm not like, I'm a good, he goes, so I don't do my schoolwork. I'm a good kid. And I I cried, like I let him go to the basketball game and I cried for an hour because he is a good kid. And you know, at that point I said, can you stay eligible? I don't care if you're a straight C student, can you just stay eligible? And that was kind of a a real turning point in our relationship because I started to understand that the schoolwork doesn't really mean anything in the overall scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Um, Our connection and the fact that, you know, that he is such a loyal kid. He is such a good kid. And it's interesting. I'm looking at this plaque that he made me for speaking of father's day, he made me for father's day years ago, uh, probably 2009. And I had been telling him that he was going to go to the big league since he was seven. And, and I'm not one of those fathers that pumps your tires. Like I'll let you know when you suck yeah. <laughs> and he'll tell you. Yeah. And so I was never one of those fathers that, that, you know, blew smoke. I was always very, I mean, honest to a fault. And sometimes, you know, I regret cause I was too honest or mean at times, but I knew what it took to be a professional athlete. And I made Daniel a promise. He was 12 years old, and I promised him I would never go to Wrigley Field, to Fenway Park, or to Yankee Stadium until he was pitching in them. And um, wow. this plaque right here, it's, uh, it says uh, – I'll actually show it to you. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that plaque right there. Yep. Yes, we can. Right? I promised my son I wouldn't go to Wrigley, Fenway, or Yankee Stadium until he was there playing in them. And he's got all the dates of the days that he debuted in those stadiums. And then a nice little note to me about always being there and, you know, and believing um, in him. And so um, it's just a, it, I, you know, I, it, that's been hanging there for years. It wasn't pre-planned or anything, but um, 
it's just something that that I've always believed in. And, and I, I will tell you this. Um, I mean, I got introduced in three Super Bowls and got to start for 12 years and, um, you know, went to Pro Bowls. Daniel talked about that time he got called up and the, and the GM of the Arizona Dimebacks called me and said, hey, he's not going to pitch, but get out here. And so we're checking into the hotel and um, and Daniel calls me and go, hey, let's grab lunch. And Daniel, what are you talking about? I'm dressed. Get over to the stadium. And so I come to the stadium and I see Daniel in his uniform and I just bust out into tears because I've got emotional incontinence. I can't, I, I, I cry at, at finding Nemo. I, I cry at everything. <laughs> so, anyhow, so I'm like literally bawling. Like I can't catch my breath bawling. And Daniel is like holding me going, it's going to be okay, dad. Like, oh my God, this guy, right? And people are like, people we don't even know are like, you're going to be okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, and anyhow, um, watching him trot out for that sixth inning against the Atlanta Braves and, and, um, and you know, getting a one, two, three inning. Um, you know, I look at all those Super Bowl experiences and all the games I started and all that stuff, and that stuff is garbage. It, it doesn't mean anything compared to watching him throw that scoreless inning for the first time. Um, it, it's been the most amazing journey, and um, I'm still stupid enough to, to try to catch him. Um, and he peppers me. Like, he doesn't throw full speed at me anymore because he almost killed me the last time he did. <laughs> but he's, I still wear at least five or six balls off the shins or the thighs or whatever every time we play catch. But um, we're still out in the yard. We were out in the yard. Was it last night or the night before? We were out in the yard. Yeah. Yeah, play catch. So uh, we're still doing it. Um, I can't really see anymore. And it's uh, one of these days I'm going to catch one right in the temple and it's going to be the end of me. But <laughs> Man, this has been a dream, though, to have you both here in the Father's Day week and uh, just, you know, just have you guys just kind of speak life into Thrive and those who are watching here. And um, man, I just feel like both of you are just incredible men of integrity and um, character and, and uh, people who we want to, who we want to be like. And um, I just want to say, thank you. Thank you so much um, for being who you are and being the example that you are and, and leading in so many incredible ways. Um, we're going to uh, try to close it out here. And I thought we could do it uh, this way. Um, so I want to ask Mark uh, some questions, some rapid fire questions, but I'm actually going to ask you and here, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> so these questions are to you, but I'm going to ask him first. And if he gets it right, then this is just a, a little fun game, but we'll, we'll give him a Starbucks gift card. Every, every answer he gets right, he gets another five bucks on the card. So, all right. So, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask the question and we're going to see uh -huh. if it's right. Okay. So Mark, uh, but you, you got to answer this first. Okay. okay. Favorite. What is his favorite stadium to play in? Uh, if not counting Denver, right? Cause, okay. Okay. We'll throw Denver. Let's out. do. Okay. We'll throw minus, Denver out. Minus Obviously. mile high. Okay. okay. Let's go. Uh, probably Arrowhead, even though it's the top, I know it's the toughest, but Kansas city Arrowhead. hundred percent. Oh yeah. hundred yeah, percent. That's the toughest place. Is. One. The way they built it, the, the, yeah, the, literally the fans are like from me to that wall behind me, which is about eight feet away. That's how far the fans are away, and they sit on they sit <laughs> so up on you. So it's like you're looking at them. They're they're just right down on you, and they're they're yelling at you. They're like they're in. You're putting like, hey, we got to do this. We got this, and they're just in your like they're in your little huddle on the sideline, screaming at you. Um, one, it's the best smelling stadium, and Daniel will attest to this because he's he's pitched against the Royals. It's the best. Yeah. It's barbecue, so you pull in and you don't even want to play. You just want to have a barbecue eating contest. It's unbelievable. Um, but I always felt like anytime I went to Kansas City, it was the toughest place in the league to play. And if you could go into Kansas City, even if you lost, but if you played well, you were a really good team. That's how I always felt about going into Kansas City. So that it was my favorite place to go play because it was the hardest place to go play. Yeah. Come on. All right. All right. So there's there's five already. Okay. So least, what is his least favorite stadium to play in? Uh, this this will be the old Cleveland Municipal 
<laughs> with the nail <laughs> with the name plates they nailed a piece of tape with your number on it, and he had to bend <laughs> over to get to the field oh. through the tunnel <laughs> yeah I, I played the home just, it was terrible it's garbage, there's yeah. pipes hanging in the visitor's locker room pipes. and they're like at 510 so you got to duck under all these pipes yeah and i took three loops around the locker room i couldn't find my locker and i'm a you know a starter i mean i'm a starting like pro bowl guard and i look at jay bernetti who's the actually he's the he's the equipment manager jay bernetti was the equipment manager of the washington redskins at 19 years old he is still now the equipment manager of the San Francisco 49ers. He's been in the NFL. He's, he's my age. He's been in the NFL for over 40 years. And he's the equipment manager. And so I walk, I take two loops around the, the thing, and I'm like, Jay Bird, where's my locker? And I was literally standing at a four-by-four four post with a nail hanging out of it. And there's a little tiny piece of tape. It had 69 on it. He goes, you're standing in it. <laughs> I was standing. He goes, "You're standing." Oh my in the locker. god! That's a good yeah, that story. place. Okay, was okay, all right. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Okay, okay. So, um, so Mark won. Uh, was a part of three Super Bowls. Um, can you name his his favorite one? I think it, it had to be thirty two because such an underdog. And no one expected that. And the team played so well. And it was like, it was the first in, in Denver history. Mm. So I, I would probably guess that one. Even the first is always special, but probably that one. Mm. Yeah, what, that, what, what no question. that one, that one, the first, the first one I played in and the last one I played in, we were prohibitive favorites. We were, yeah, you know, eight, them, yeah. 10 point favorites. So honestly, winning those felt more like relief than anything else. Yeah. Like you took care of your responsibility wow. and there was a You're sense of relief. Mm -hmm. Super Bowl 32 was euphoric. It was, it, we were 13 point underdogs, you know, going it's into the underdogs game. ever, I think. Right. Yeah. We were the largest underdog ever to win a Super ever. Bowl at the time. And, and, and or now maybe the Jets were, but we were maybe the second. Anyhow, it didn't matter. Like nobody but, but the guys on the team thought we could win. And that, that game, to see what it meant to John Elway to watch him get drubbed in three. Cause I was a, you know, I was a, a historian of the game. I love football. So I knew John's history. We all did. And, um, and again, it's like I told you in Philippians, when you're playing for something bigger than yourself, you know, and we were all playing for John. So there's, it's not even close that Super Bowl 32 is, um, is the, the greatest game I've ever had the opportunity to play it. Awesome. Amazing. That was awesome. So cool. Okay. So what do you think his favorite sport to watch is outside of football? Baseball. Yeah. So it only, it's really, you know, I don't watch a lot of hoops. Um, I don't want, I watch a little bit of hockey. I'll watch playoff hoops. I love baseball. Um, and I never liked it growing up as a kid, but when Daniel and I made that connection, um, he was, like he was literally two years old when we started playing. I, I coached him in T-ball at four and we had been playing, like we had mitts and, and baseballs and stuff. And we had been playing since he was two. And so wow. Daniel was a super skilled, like super skilled four-year-old and T-ball started at five, but I got him in the league at four and I just thought everybody could play and nobody could catch or throw and everybody was scared to death of Daniel because he threw so hard. The funniest T-ball story real quick is we're playing a T-ball game and Daniel turned to double play. He's four years old, right? So the base is always loaded in T-ball and he, um, uh, he's playing first base as a lefty and the ball gets hit to him line drive. He catches it right out of there. Bam, steps on first. It's double play. And all the parents are going – what the heck just happened, right? <laughs> Nobody can believe it. So we're driving home, you know, and he's in the back, and you can see the little wheels turning. I'm like looking in the rearview mirror. And he goes, you know, Dad, he goes, the next game I think I'll turn a triple play. And I was like, hey, triple play is pretty much, you know, impossible. <laughs> like nobody can turn a triple play. You just you can't do it. He's like, no, yeah, I know, but I think I'll do that next game. I was like, all right, well, it just let me, I'm just kind of – you know, making sure that I, I tamp down your, uh, 
you know, your excitement because these never happen. Expectations. Yeah. So here's my little lefty playing third base, bases loaded, line drive right to him, just snags it out of the air, steps on third, spins, and throws an absolute bullet to the second baseman who is standing on top of the base with his eyes closed. And the ball just goes whack right into the mitt, and he catches it. And the crowd just, like, everybody stops. And it's dead silent for about three seconds. And all of a sudden, the kids go, triple play! And everybody's <laughs> throwing their hats in the air, and everybody runs into the dugout. Well, in T-ball, the whole team gets to bat before. It doesn't matter how many outs you record. Usually, you never record any outs. Every kid gets to hit on the team, you know? So all the kids come running in. They're throwing their hats. We got to get everybody's hat reorganized, get it back, and hat, send everybody back out to the field. <laughs> and then he's just like nonchalant on the way home. I told you I'd turn a triple. It's no big deal. Like you knew he was, you knew he was going to be special. You're like, all right, he's got a little something. Oh my gosh. I never know that. That's an amazing story. Okay. So Danny, what would you say is the best advice your dad has ever given? Oh man. Jeez. This is like, this, I, there's like, yeah. There's too much stuff. Yeah. Oh, let me think for a second. Yeah. I'll, I'll get back to that one. Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. yeah. I'll give you. I'll give you one that's um, been that's been really recent. Can I give you one that's been really recent? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. All right. So one of the things as this baseball journey has continued, where all these doors have slammed in his face, and he continues to just bust his butt, continues to work, continues to believe in himself. My big thing was I walked away from professional sports after 29 surgeries and I was never late to a meeting. Um, I was never unprepared. Um, I never missed a lift. I, I worked my butt off. And when I was done, I was done. And there has never been one time that I ever looked back on my career and said, gosh, I wish I would have just prepared more or studied harder, or worked out more, or whatever. I walked away and said, okay, that's done, and what's next? And the thing I've, I've told Daniel in the last five years of continuing to chase this, where everybody and their brother's uncle said, hey, it's over, quit, is I don't ever want to see you at 45 sitting on your couch going, man, I wish I'd have just given it one more shot. Right. Just let it, hey, if it's done, it's done but let it be done on your terms. And then you'll never have to look back on your life. Cause I've seen so many guys that I played with that, that have said, you know, gosh, I wish I would have just, I wish I would have just. And um, as my grandmother used to say to me when I was a little boy, whenever I said, I wish she would always stop me and say, don't wish your life away. Yeah. That's don't yeah. wish your life away. That's just, go do it. just do it. So i um, very proud of him for the persistence. Um, and uh, I know that uh, I'm just standing in faith um, that it's going to pay off uh, and it's going to pay off here in the, in the next, hopefully week or two. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we'll see. That's right. And you are essentially a free agent right now. And that's yeah. kind of just to fill in everybody right here. So be praying that, that God uh, just opens the door, guides you exactly where you're supposed to. Um, Man, what a privilege to have you guys uh, on. Mark, I just wanted to know if you'd close us uh, in prayer yeah. and just pray for the guys uh, watching here tonight. And um, yeah. Just, yeah, anything Absolutely. that's on your heart to pray, go ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Father God, I just come before you and I just praise you, Lord God. I thank you so much that we have the opportunity to connect, Lord God. I would just ask you to continue to encourage us to connect, continue to encourage us to love, continue to encourage us to extend grace to one another, Lord God, especially in these times, yes. to extend that grace, to love one another, to be connected to one another, to pick one another up and to encourage, encourage one another and all the more as the day draws near, Lord God. Thank you that we could be together. Lord, I know there are a lot of issues and there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of strife and there's a lot of uncertainty, and there's a lot of economic issues, and there are a lot of things that are overwhelming us last night, or right now, this night. And I would just pray for your peace, the peace yes, that God. surpasses understanding, Lord God, yes, Lord. that we would just dive into you, and that you would comfort us, 
and that you would take us through these times because I know this, Lord God, whether you get COVID, 100% of us that get COVID are going to die. 100% of us that don't get COVID are going to die. You are in control. Yes, God. You are God. Yes. You are there. And we just thank you for your presence in our life. We just ask you to bless all the people that are watching this tonight. Lord God, we just have your blessed hand upon our families, Lord God, our extended families, that you would just strengthen us, that you would strengthen our faith, faith that you would give us uh, encouragement, Lord God, and that you would help us to continue to be light, to be salt, to continue yes. to walk in your word, in your presence, and that we could go out and not just go to church, but we could literally be the church that influences everybody in this dark time. And I would ask all these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.